Thank you very much, uh, Andy, and thank you to EDGESERV for inviting me along today. I have learnt a great deal, uh, probably primarily because I am not a technologist, I'm not a data scientist, uh, and I know absolutely nothing about ICT. So apologies in advance for all of that massive gap in my knowledge and understanding. What I do hope that I know a little bit about is reform to public services. And what I'm going to talk about briefly, um, and as Andy said, it's in relation to a report that Demos, along with SAS UK, which is a division of a big multinational uh, data analytics company, and with Research Republic, which is a partner organisation of ours, produced this year, uh, is around what we think the uh, potential benefits and also the potential challenges for making use of big data in public services will be. And before I go into my presentation, which, by the way, is the least cool of all of the slideshows you've had today. I've been very impressed with the various diagrams and the animations. Mine is just bullet points. I'm very sorry for that. Um, before I go into that, a couple of observations on things that we've kind of heard today, which I think are interesting and which it's important to think about before we launch into it. At the very start of the day, Andy said that there was a lot of confusion, confusion that he thought was potentially unhelpful, between the open data agenda and the big data agenda. And I think that's true. And I think certainly that central government has been in some way responsible for this because we never really hear from central government about big data. What we hear about is open data and sometimes wrapped into that are actually proposals and ideas around big data. But I also think that confusion within the public sector is to some extent necessary. As I'll go on to talk about a little bit when I'm kind of trying to run through some of the the risks and the challenges around the big data uh, agenda and public services. There simply, and we have to be honest about this, there simply is not necessarily the expertise within uh, the public sector outside, of course, of universities where we're all fabulous and know everything about everything. There simply isn't the expertise to necessarily make use in the best possible way of the vast resources of data that are held. And add into that a kind of moral, ethical question about whether or not simply because we produce data in our relationships with government, government then necessarily owns that. And I think actually you have a really strong case for the close marriage between the open data and big data agendas that the government has put forward, certainly in terms of the rhetoric around what the government wants to do with data. And the only other observation I make is that uh, the reason that we were interested in looking at this, Demos is a think tank, we do airy-fairy political stuff, uh, we're not you know, there are no graphs because there are no facts. It's all about what it is. <laughs> it's all about what it is that we think might happen. So um, uh, the reason we were interested in looking at this is because we've been concerned for some time about declining levels of trust in, that the public have in the services that are supposed to be serving them. And that's almost across the board. I mean, there are some exceptions. People still love their GPs. Uh, they hate the NHS. I mean, they think the NHS is incredibly inefficient, but they love their GPs. Uh, but across the board, overall, public services have a declining level of trust. And we run focus groups and other such daft social science things in order to try and get at why it is that trust is declining so rapidly and so drastically in public services and in the public sector. And the conclusion that we keep coming back to is that uh, whereas you might argue that uh, in lots of different areas, the public sector once upon a time broadly resembled the commercial sector in terms of how it dealt with its clients or its, uh, uh, the people that it was there to serve, uh, the commercial sector has moved on. So we expect now Amazon, which was raised earlier, to know things about our purchases and not to bother us with things that are irrelevant to us. And we expect Google to understand what it is we're likely to be searching for. The public services have not adapted in the same way. They haven't driven themselves forward. And because it's not a sector where displacement happens naturally, uh, we, we have not been able to kind of uh, push that through. And I think that uh, in that sense, even though big data in terms of how the public services uh, use it is massively under uh, impactful, Actually, big data has had a massive impact on public services because what it's done is helped create an atmosphere where our expectations of what public services are able to offer us are no longer met. Uh, and that is, that is inherently problematic. Now then, I am uh, ironically perhaps terrible at technology. So we're going to try this. Uh, oh, that's the wrong one. That would be why. We knew that was going to happen. Okay. 
I think it's important to take a step back. You guys all know an awful lot about uh, kind of ICT systems and what you can do with massive data sets, and those of you who are researchers are using these things on a, a daily basis. Uh, in, in the public sector, we still have to have a conversation about why uh, big data is important, why proper engagement with understanding of an analysis of big data uh, is vitally important. And we've heard a lot about organizational change. Um, and obviously, within the private sector, that happens uh, in healthy and successful companies within those companies or in sectors where there aren't necessarily healthy and successful companies. It happens through displacement. In the public sector, uh, organizational change, taking public servants with us in terms of understanding why the collection, collation, and analysis of big data is so important is going to be an even bigger challenge than it is in your Tesco or your, your uh, other commercial enterprise. And key to understanding why that is, is something that's really rather nice about public servants, which is the sense of vocation. We ran several focus groups with people running up, working at every level in different public services from the kind of real front line all the way up to uh, almost permanent secretary level in, in kind of Whitehall. And what you get from people when you start talking to them about how to analyze data, how to understand the messages that are being uh, transmitted to them and the, the insight, is a very real sense, especially from frontline workers, that they almost see data analysis as being adversarial to their sense of their purpose because they think that they're in a vocation and they want to treat people like human beings. And you hear this a lot from doctors, actually. I'm sure anyone who's worked in uh, the healthcare area will, will agree. And the important, the overriding message in terms of how to sell this agenda to frontline workers and, and, and public servants is that the beauty of big data, I would argue, and the beauty of it used properly within the public service world is that it makes your relationships with people more human and more reciprocal, and it gives you better understanding of people. It's not about turning you into a robot. And I think it was Anthony's uh, slide earlier which showed how you can uh, jiggle the, the doctor-patient relationship actually summed that up really beautifully. But we've identified four key areas where we think learning from both the kind of commercial sector and from attempts in other countries to uh, utilize big data better within public services, where we think that real uh, advances can be made and where we think the benefits can be readily sold to public servants. The first of those is around innovation. And any of you who work in a commercial environment will intuitively understand why this is an important thing to understand if you're trying to run a kind of people-driven business. Um, uh, data can drive uh, huge public sector innovation. We've seen that in other countries. We've seen that in uh, Canada and elsewhere. Uh, the important thing about this, and it brings me back to my slight quibble with the open data, big data separation, is to understand that this requires us to uh, make public sector data, once it's generated, accessible to those who lie outside of public services. Uh, that's in part about skills, or that's not to say that the knowledge contained within uh, the public sector is not vital to kind of understanding, but it's also partly about uh, trying to build new systems of engagement. And when we talk about that separation, about how the public, service engage, public servants engage with their clients, as opposed to how the commercial sector engages with its clients, one of the key things it comes down to is this idea of relationships and understanding. And because in public services we're not on the whole talking about people who are on a daily basis uh, being measured against the satisfaction of their clients because their clients on the whole can't walk away, we need outside innovation in order to help us to understand what would be useful. And this is something that I think the public sector has been very, very poor at. There are huge, huge, huge quantities of data out there. And the stuff that's obviously and automatically useful, stuff around uh, kind of genomes and, and disease and the spread of uh, illness, etc., uh, that's being pursued brilliantly by all kinds of clever people, some of whom are in this room. But the stuff that's not obviously useful, but would be obviously useful to Tesco's, is not necessarily being used particularly well. And if we think about public sector uh, and uh, the, 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 the places at which we access the public sector, one of the things that's been hugely problematic over the last decade has been the way in which certain public sector brands like Job Centre Plus have been completely toxified. 
People absolutely loathe them. Uh, they feel belittled by them. They feel like these places have no understanding of them as an individual. Uh, and in some ways, and slightly counterintuitively, certainly to a lot of uh, frontline workers, big data can help us to solve some of those problems around the toxicity of brands because it can help us to track individual journeys. It can help us to learn about what it is that uh, makes people disengage at certain points from vital public services. And right across the board, from healthcare to welfare, this is increasingly important because the, 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 one of the big kind of uh, reasons for inefficiency within the public sector has been the fact that we uh, turn people off and they only come at the last minute. So one of the big inefficiencies has been people's reluctance to voluntarily engage with, the public, with public services. And that's something that big data can help us with by tracking those journeys in exactly the same way that you would track a customer's journey from the moment they walk into the Tesco's until the moment they leave and they spent their money. And that can help us to improve the service that we're offering. Um, I mentioned outside impetus and, and getting people outside to assist. Uh, the other important thing that public services at a kind of central Whitehall level need to get much, much better at, in our view, is uh, aligning the way in which they engage with their own staff with the data they already have. So uh, DWP has this ideas generating system. It's very clever. They call it a game. It's not a game. What it is is like TripAdvisor. And so the staff... Uh, type in ideas and then the other staff vote on them and the ones that get to the top, the permanent secretary sees and he goes, oh, that's marvellous, let's do that. It's brilliant, but it's completely lacking context because what DWP haven't done is communicated with their staff data that explains to them the problems that DWP as a, as a corporate body experiences. So it's great to have innovative, fresh new ideas from the woman working on the front desk at Job Centre Plus in uh, Darlington, but unless that woman has a broader understanding that is quite easily communicable if you just take the, all the data analysis that's already done and disseminate that so that public servants understand why it's relevant to them, you end up with a set of ideas which might be fantastic but are broadly irrelevant. And so that's something that in terms of innovation and if we want to engage public servants in this process, we need to get much better at. Allocation. Uh, resource allocation is a huge component of this. We want to be able to allocate resources in our public services in a way that is efficient and in a way that responds to need. But at the same time, we're fragmenting the way in which uh, we commission public services. And so uh, you, have, you will have health and wellbeing boards distributing uh, the public health money that uh, epidemiologists feed into in terms of understanding why that's important. You'll have PCCs, policing and crime commissioners, uh, deciding on how we're going to allocate resources within policing areas. And that's, you know, whatever you think of the politics of that, that's the direction of travel. So what is needed in terms of the public sector is something which uh, the public sector is incredibly bad at and which if clever university people could uh, come up with a solution for, that would be commendable, which is better segmentation of the data sets that exist. Um, the last government experimented with this through kind of total place um, and trying to build a kind of neighborhood level understanding of the various interactions that people within those areas have had with public services, the various needs they have, et cetera. It is by no means uh, close enough. And when you think that a, a major retailer understands on a store by store basis and allocates product and, and, and changes their supply chain on a store-by-store -store basis in order to have the most efficient offering possible. You can see the huge difference then that we see in the public sector where the uh, starting point is that everything will be pretty much the same until it becomes incredibly obvious that something needs to change and normally that's changed at a fairly big level. So we need to get much, much better at understanding how to segment data, how to understand it at a local basis and how to then connect that data analyze and provide insight from it to the people who are with the best will in the world, not technocrats, they're going to be enthusiastic amateurs who are elected. They need to have uh, clever people like you distilling data for them in a way that enables them to make decisions that are informed on the basis of uh, the science. Um, understanding. If you're a company, you have an incentive to, understand, to develop an understanding of what other needs your customers might have. So you have an incentive that's fairly obvious to you because if you can understand a new need or a need that's not being met through your current offering, you can make more money out of it. And that's really uh, an important and very basic way in which capitalism works quite effectively. 
uh, public services don't necessarily have that incentive. In fact, in many ways, they have a counter incentive because the discovery of new need means more work and because resources, uh, certainly over the last couple of years, are only declining. And so what big data allows us to do is to uh, draw a link between the extra work that you are putting in because you've discovered a new need, which you've discovered through big data, um, and to draw a link between that and savings further down the road. There's been a lot of very excitable talk about new ways of funding public services, new ways of funding charitable endeavour, things like social impact bonds where uh, you essentially commercialise the process on the basis of the money that will be saved by the intervention that you made. All of those things uh, are at a very developmental stage now, and all of them require us to be able to analyse what's happened before and then predict on that basis. And the, uh, the slide that the previous speaker uh, used around the, the landslide and being able to analyse that, I mean, obviously, that's a slightly more sure thing, I would imagine. But nonetheless, there's a really important corollary here. If we're thinking about healthcare interventions, if we're thinking about uh, neighbourhood interventions around what you do to avert crime and, and prevent crime, etc., and if we're thinking about educational interventions, these things cost money. So as a local authority or as a... PCC or whatever it is, you've got to make a brave decision that you're going to find some extra money, you're going to take it from somewhere else, and you're going to put it into, the, into this thing. If we can use big data to demonstrate the trends coming out of those interventions, to demonstrate the money saved later on, that decision suddenly becomes a lot easier. And in the early days of the Blair government, um, when it was very, very popular to talk about return on investment and doing cost-benefit analyses, etc., one senior minister eventually said to his civil servants, I don't want to hear any more about cost-benefit analysis or return on investment or future long-term predicated savings because it's all bollocks. <laughs> and the awful thing is that he was kind of right, uh, except that uh, it was, he was kind of right in that you can't show it, and if you can't show it, it's not true. But what big data and what at using the existing data sets that we have and generating new ones and having an understanding of what new data we need to generate around trial interventions and pilots and how much longer we need to follow people for, etc., we can start to show it in a way that's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more safe, shall we say, than simply me saying, oh, but then only 10 of these kids did this. And that's, that's a really crucial thing. And so I think the big data is the missing link uh, in lots of the kind of innovative funding models that are being talked about. And then finally, uh, in terms of the, the, the good stuff, there's the question of improvement, which I've kind of separated out from everything else, because I think this is the bit where you can have a really productive conversation with frontline workers. Improvement is about day-to-day. -day. It's about technical uh, improvement across uh, a range of, of, of things that you're doing in your day-to-day -day work. And... It resembles most closely, and I can't remember which speaker it was that was, it was the keynote um, this morning, it was about utility companies and the way in which they use real time data in order to understand uh, how they can better allocate energy or water or whatever it is that they're dealing with. Real time data is potentially incredibly important in public services, particularly, and certainly the place where most advances have been made in this, particularly around policing. And uh, here we're not just talking about using your own data but we're also talking about using uh, publicly available data. And so we're talking about, during the London riots, finding a way of using the social networking information that's being produced and processed uh, in order to have a much more clear understanding of where, with your limited policing resource, you can make the most impact. Um, and I realise, of course, that this is an incredibly controversial thing. I think people talk about snooping a lot. And... Uh, Obviously, um, it's up to everyone to have their view on it, but I would recommend a paper that Demos produced uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was by the former head of GCHQ, uh, talking about, and he has a vested interest, I think we should be honest, um, talking about this issue um, and what, it, what the kind of right level. And he makes the point absolutely brilliantly that uh, arguably what we're talking about doing here is taking um, the ad hoc process of human intelligence and this applies outside of just policing or spying, or whatever you want to call it, but taking the, the ad hoc process of human intelligence from the woman on the front desk at Job Centre Plus in Darlington or from uh, the, 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 the chap who happens to be parked outside with a little 
um, dish listening to the conversation inside. And we're making that a more scientific process by uh, using, using data rather than using um, purely human insight. Um, and public servants properly trained in, in basic analysis should be able to use live data. And crucial to that is that we start producing more live data uh, in our public services. And one of the huge issues, and when we go on to talk about uh, challenges, which I will very briefly in a second, one of the huge issues is that actually uh, the public sector produces quite a lot of crap data, produces quite a lot of essentially meaningless data, and sometimes misses huge amounts that it could be collating and collecting. Um, and then there's another problem, which is uh, the speed or the relative lack of speed at which what the uh, collection transmits to use. So we're not there yet. There are a number of challenges uh, to embedding big data in, in public servants' professional lives. I've outlined three um, because I think they're the three most important. Fear. Fear is powerful um, and fear exists. And when we talk about fear, we need to be clear that we're talking about both public servants themselves and their levels of fear, but we're also talking about the public. And it's been alluded to throughout today, but I think it bears repeating quite clearly that the public is incredibly and deeply suspicious of attempts to collect their data. And I realized just how powerful this feeling is when I went to register for a new doctor because I'd moved house. And I was working on this project at the time. And I know how important it is that the NHS is able to use my records for medical research. But still, my pen lingered over the little box that I had to tick as I kind of sat and thought, well, is there anything embarrassing in my medical records? But we'll leave that for drinks. But the. The fear that the public has has to be overcome, and it can only be overcome by talking about those benefits. I think that we need to move in terms of the government's uh, position on this and the rhetoric that's used around this. We need, to use, we need to move to a position, which we're not yet in, where the government talks and where government ministers talk openly about this being something of a civic duty. So we have a responsibility to one another as members of a community. That responsibility... Uh, means utilising, uh, giving other people the ability to utilise the data that we generate as we reap the benefits of our uh, mom, ma mammoth uh, welfare state. Skills. Oh, no, sorry. Fear in public servants. The fear in public servants is twofold. One is what I alluded to earlier, which is that this idea that big data somehow, or any kind of data, you know, the public servants talk about paperwork as if they're the only people on earth who've ever had to fill out a form. Um, but there is a justifiable... Uh, question mark in their heads about the extent to which a more rigorous and vigorous use of big data across public services will in effect mean more paperwork for them and more form filling or collation and collection for them. That can be overcome, it, it be overcome I think through, through tech but, and through skills but nonetheless that exists and the secondary fear is that because of some of the stuff uh, which I was earlier being a friend of, but I'm now going to be an enemy of, because of some of the stuff about openness being confused with proper data use and, and better use of big data, there is a real fear uh, amongst lots of public servants that what this agenda is actually about is just catching people out. And I think that we have to be sending some positive messages about this helping people to fulfil their vocations rather than being about helping to bash uh, public servants over the head. I gave evidence to um, Hackney Council Scrutiny Committee, it's so exciting, glamorous, um, when they were talking about the issue of what to make transparent, what to put online, etc. Um, it was extraordinary. Uh, they were sat there and uh, one of them was, was talking about well, what if the press get hold of it and then they don't understand it. And I suppose it's a little bit similar to the question about research data and what if uh, somebody takes my data and then misuses it. I think we're all going to have to grow up about that a little bit. Um, I don't think we any longer live in a world where much that happens in government can be secret forever anyway. Far better, far better to, to publish it up front. But we do need to be reinforcing for public servants themselves, for the people who are worried about being caught out and being uh, hijacked and attacked, we do need to keep reiterating to them that there are huge positives for them in the day-to-day -day doing of their job. Uh, skills, uh, throughout today, I've been struck by the fact that uh, people have talked about the lack of adequate skills in terms of data scientists or whatever you want to call them, uh, kind of Californian surfing business analysts, whatever they are, uh, the lack of skill uh, in the British marketplace across the board, which in a way is slightly reassuring because we kind of believe that that uh, was, was a, uh, an overwhelming factor in the public sector. and We didn't really look that much at the extent to which there's a skill gap 
It's the same in the private sector. And because that's across the board, uh, that's an area where I think government and indeed universities have an enormous role to play in terms of trying to fill in some of this gap. We are miles behind lots of other countries. I mean, presumably we're miles behind America because apparently that's where they all live. Um, finally, finally, tech, and this is where I'm slightly embarrassed because, I mean, you know, I think we can all tell, and we're all friends now, so we can all tell I know nothing about tech. Um, I do know what it is that people who are responsible for trying to drive change in the use of data across public services say about tech. They say that it's underinvested in, um, and they also say that there's a lack of understanding uh, in terms of central government, in terms of uh, permanent secretaries, in terms of the people who are in charge of driving lots of this forward, an acute lack of understanding about what it's for, and so therefore a lack of understanding about why you invest, which I think brings us back to the question, the overall question around uh, fear and around driving some positive messages about this. My final, final, final comment, and I will shut up, I absolutely promise, is that uh, actually the university sector has a huge role to play in demonstrating what change looks like and in driving it forward and in helping to start to bridge some of those kind of culture gaps that exist. The university sector has long, in a uh, uh, wide array of areas, um, been a, a, an interesting bridge between the public sector in terms of ethos, in terms of mission, and the private sector in terms of relationships that exist, in terms of investment, etc. Uh, that, in, in terms of the big data conversation, and the big data conversation with public servants, is going to be ever more important. And I think there's really interesting stuff being done by organisations like Dartington that are kind of quasi-academic uh, organisations, which is precisely about this thing of how you take those massive, massive government data sets you interrogate them, you understand them, you analyse them, you generate insight from them, and that insight is something you can change in the day-to-day -day management and delivery of public services. But Dartington's tiny compared to what the government is, and so the real key then is to find ways of evangelising and driving change in terms of the attitude to data in central government itself. Thank you so much for being patient. Max, thank you very much. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, any questions for Max? John. <laughs> I'll chat. Um, okay. Uh, Bodes well. Uh, Ken Chad Consulting. And um, I want to pick up this thing about trust. Um, yeah. And I think that there's an area where that's relevant to the area I work in, which is HE and indeed public libraries, which are not a toxic brand. Um, which actually quite the reverse, you know, they've got a lot of things going for them. Mm -hmm. the so they're interested in this big data, but as we said, the skills and all these things are lacking. So there's where their big data tends to be residing is, for example, with publishers or aggregators, you know, the dirty Elseviers and the world and all that kind of stuff, the dark laws. So what's, is there a way in which you could perhaps suggest a, you know, it's not a technology solution, as you mm. see. It's, so here we've got trusted public services, both in academic libraries and, and local authorities, who don't have the skills, who don't have the infrastructure, who have very valuable data. How are they going to combine that trust so that, for example, when somebody said to me, don't buy Facebook shares, because they're going to go bust, because they will lose the trust. So, you know, 2014 Facebook failure could be the library or the public sector opportunity to deliver big data, perhaps in a trustful way, but how might you see that kind of linking up and working? So I, I don't know whether this will be an answer to your question, um, so I apologise in advance. I think that there's a, a really interesting point here, which is, um, so one of the things, so when local authorities commission people to run their bin services or to run their uh, care services even, they, they never, I mean, I'm sure there are some heroic examples, they never think about um, the, the data that the commercial company, be it a circo of this world or a capital or whatever, the data that they're going to be producing, which streamlines their own way of working and which therefore generates a profit for them. And I think the single biggest and best thing that you could do for free in terms of the public sector and helping them to understand what data could mean for them is getting written into commissioning contracts. And I, I, I will bring it back to but getting written into commissioning contracts that the data will be shared, that the data will be accessible, that seeing as it's generated using public funds and, pub, and delivering public services, that it belongs in some sense at least to the public. 
It was an extraordinary thing going back to, well, I won't mention the specific council, although given the rest of the talk, you can probably guess. Um, this brilliant question that, the, that one of the councillors asked me, which was, you know, we asked uh, a company delivering a set of services for us to come and give evidence to the Scrutiny Commission, and they refused because it wasn't in their contract, right? And there is a huge amount of this, this kind of um, public agencies, public bodies, who you're right, don't necessarily have the skills, etc., but allowing other people not simply to monetize uh, the data that is created or the data that they own, but then reaping no particular advantage from it at all subsequently. And so I think there's a huge job of education to be done around what you can get back, whether it's sharing uh, your uh, material so that it can be digitized and, and curated, um, or whether it's you know, commissioning someone to, to collect your bins and wondering how it is they manage to do it at half the price and turn a £50,000 a year profit. There's a huge amount that can be done just purely through how we write those commissioning contracts and how we educate public servants in what they're supposed to be getting back for the contracts that they're handing out. And I think that's a kind of public responsibility that public servants have, but that they're not necessarily aware of. And we have to bear in mind that when you're talking about, again, everything from the, the resources you're talking about uh, in terms of research, in terms of, uh, in terms of, of data that's being generated there, to much, much more mundane stuff in terms of uh, bins, to use my glib example again, uh, the idea that uh, you can't ask for that data, you can't ask for it because somehow that would be an impertinence. That has to kind of go out the window when commercial enterprises engage in contracts with each other to share things so that one side or the other can monetize it because they have the skills. You can bet your bottom dollar that only the very stupidest CEO is signing a contract which gives them no long-term gain from what has been created. I'm going to move us on now. Great, thank you. Can we just say thank you once again to Matt? <laughs>